Chris and Enough have been a huge part of this event so far, and we're very, very, very excited to showcase their business and his unique approach. And we'd like to have the woman who introduced Chris and Enough to us, Kathy Scalzo, do the introduction. I'd like to thank you guys for inviting me here. I feel so incredibly special for being part of this because you say that you you only invite certain people in, you know, they have to fit. And I, at first I was like, yeah, right, that's just something that you say. But I know from personal experience, because I introduced him to a transformation coach that I thought would be a good fit for this group, but he didn't let him in. So it's true what he says. He only wants the best, highest quality people in this group, so. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And I'm so incredibly thankful that Chris and Hannah came with me. Ah. So I'll tell you a little bit of my story real quick. Like I was a nurse for 20 years, working 12 hour night shifts, completely and totally burned out from that. I needed something different. And a friend of mine was like, oh, you already help people. You'd be really good at financial services. I'm like, you're crazy. I'm a nurse. I know nothing about finances. But then I went to her little meeting, you know, they get rah, 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 and like, oh, the CEO of the company was a nurse like me, so I'm like, oh, maybe I can do this. So I got my license, joined that company, and then it was just, recruit, recruit, recruit. I don't even know what I'm doing, how am I going to know I'm going to recruit people through this company? And I'd ask about their products, and they'd say, oh, don't worry about it, you don't need to know, just copy my words. I'm like, what? I'm dealing with people's money, I kind of think I need to know what I'm doing. So, like, forget it, this business is not for me. And I was trying to figure out what I want to do when I grew up and met somebody <laughs> online networking who told me about infinite banking. Told me to read the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, which I did. And my life was completely changed right there. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Everybody needs to know about this. So I went into deep research mode on YouTube University. <laughs> <laughs> and I came across Life 180, Chris Kirkpatrick. Video after video, was just so much information. He had nothing to sell because at the time he wasn't even an agent. He just wanted to get the word out and change people's lives. So I reached out to him and he said, actually, I'm starting my own agency. So he didn't even, it wasn't an agency at that time. Mm -hmm. He was like, how about you join me? I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. And then I just resonated with him so much. Like not only about the finance side, but his personality, his spirituality, everything was just amazing. And like, I am so incredibly blessed to be with this guy. And then last month, I went to his life insurance mastermind retreat in the Dominican Republic. That was absolutely amazing. And his lovely wife, Enough, <laughs> otherwise known as Hannah, <laughs> Mrs. American. What year? 2021. <laughs> she's, she's the most amazing person. I just love her energy. She's, oh gosh. The two of them together, what a power couple. So I am just so incredibly grateful to you for all that you have taught me. It's just such a pleasure being part of your company. So Chris used to be a part of a, a big um, insurance company. He was a business <coughs> development director and realized that, that um, he was selling the wrong thing. So mm -hmm. somebody uh, opened his eyes and now he's on a mission to open everybody's eyes. and. And realize that you know we don't need to be dependent on the banks and the government and all this stuff. So, so he is going to tell you a little bit about cash flow hacking, which brings infinite banking to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. So you can whatever you're investing in, just start there first. Leverage your policy to to make your investments even better. All it does is add a couple extra percentage points to what's our, what you're already doing, and create an instant legacy for your. I think I got I'm mic'd up so we're good so so guys sorry uh, my computer you know technical issues are always fun right so I have a special way of doing things that I like to travel with this little doohickey and there we go hopefully it will sync up there we go so does everybody mind if I sit while I do this, like I don't, I don't like to get, I don't like to get, I don't like to get too formal. Okay, um, so I used to be the director of business development for uh, one of the top. Uh, it was a Fortune 1000 life insurance company. Um, I remember I was, I was sharing this story this morning, but I remember going into the office. My job was to go around, recruit people, teach all the top agents around the country, you know, how to, how to sell. And I remember 
I learned about the product, some things, and I can't get into all, all the detail. We don't have enough time about that. But I went to the head of business development, uh, a, a woman named and, and I went to her and I was like, hey, I just found some things out about this product. And I mean, we're not, we're not telling everybody, we're not telling all these agents all the, the, these details. And, and, and she was like, no, like you're, if you told them that, we wouldn't sell as much. And I'm like, how is that? How is that? Like, I, like, that's such a breach of integrity. And, and she's like, well, if you say it, you know, you don't have a job here basically. And so I said, well, I guess, you know, and then I went and I, my wife is amazing because I went to her and I was struggling with the decision because I'd worked hard to get to this position. I was, you know, 20 years younger than the, mo you know, the other people on the leadership team. And I was like, you don't get to this place and, and, and walk away from this. And she was like, babe, I know you, if you don't quit, you're going to be miserable and I'm not living with you like that. So, um, so, so I'm a stubborn SOB and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, that decision caused a lot of challenges. I actually had to give up my license because I got into a non-compete lawsuit. Um, I ended up after two years winning the lawsuit, but then it was going to be lawsuit after lawsuit because they just were finding ways to try to bury me because it was like, they didn't want me to share what I learned. And so I, I, I just have a real passion for understanding money. Um, I, I love, I think money is one of the most important things. Um, I think it impacts every other area of our life more than anything. If you look at divorce rates, one of the top reasons for divorces is money. If you look at financial stress or like stress in general, disease, we can tie most of this to money. And, and I feel like people do the best they can do with the information that they have and the tools and the resources that they have available to them. And it's, it's just like, so my passion is helping people understand just some basic foundational elements so you can make decisions that are alignment with your values and beliefs. Money is just a tool to create the life that we want to live. Would everybody agree to that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so like when we, when we look at it that way and we, and, we, and we think about the fact that money is just a tool to create the life that we want to live, like how much sense does it make? Sorry, this is going to keep doing this unless I move it. How much sense does it make to, you know, go to school, get a job, invest in a 401k, not saying that like, if you have a 401k, I'm not being critical, but like we're taking our money, which is supposed to be this resource that we're supposed to like take and expand our lives with, but we're giving up control of it for 30 years, hoping that maybe 30 years from now, we're going to get to where we want to be, right? It doesn't make any sense. So one of the things that really got me into this business that got me really excited is this concept of financial efficiency. So I remember when I started and, and I, and, and I, well, not when I started, when I left, this company, one of the things that really resonated with me is this idea of financial efficiency. So when I first started in this business and having a lot of success, I would go around telling everybody I was a financial efficiency coach, you know, and I'm going to, I'll give you the punchline. We utilize whole life insurance as a foundational asset. That's what the infinite banking thing is. That's what I call cash flow hacking. There's a lot of different marketing names, but ultimately I love whole life insurance as a foundational asset. I think by the end of this you know, presentation, you're going to understand why. I'm going to try to get all the details. I mean, it's so much to say in so little time, but um, the whole idea of financial efficiency is, is what drives me. So let me, I, I, I want to ask, like, does anybody here have any, like, would be able to say, like, give a definition of what they think financial efficiency is? Has anybody ever, has anybody ever thought about that term in their own life? Yeah, yeah you can do it. <laughs> no? Do you want to go? Or you want to? Okay. <laughs> Well, actually, since you're in the business, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it would be probably the uh, using using capital or means of capital mm -hmm. effectively and quickly to deliver results. Cool. Awesome. Maximizing, maximizing the potential of your money. Perfect. Yep. Velocity of cash. Awesome. Using your dollar more than your Mm-hmm. Okay. Awesome. So when we, and those are all... Right, like, there are, like there's no right or wrong answer, right? Like we could probably come up with 10 definitions that, that would all have relevance. Um, I look at it, it's, it's like if we think about gas efficiency, it's right, it's like how do we go further with the same amount, right? Like it's how do we get more out of our life with the same cash flow, right? Right, and, and, and a lot of that is getting your dollar to perform multiple functions. And so when I look at this, I started thinking about this, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna go here. So I started thinking about this and I started looking at like the average, you know, family and what people are doing. So 
the average, like, let's just take a household that's making $100,000, right? And what happens with, you know, with, with a household like this, the typical, you know, household is going to save 10%, which is $10,000 a year, right? And so if they're saving $10,000 a year, what are they doing? Everybody's going out trying to chase the greatest rate of return that they could possibly get, right? So the idea is, you, you know, you, you invest 10% per year, you get that 8% return, you know, and we do that. And so what are we doing? I, I, just, I just invested $10,000 to get an $800 return, right? And so the thing is, now I got $10,800, which is great, but one of the things that people don't talk a lot about is the fact that we took a lot of risk to get there, right? And so there's no guarantee that we're gonna have that growth. The cha the, and, and what really, and I thank God I had this guy, he was a mentor, his name is Don Blanton, he's just like one of the OGs in the space, and I just remember the first time he was like, Chris, the biggest problem with America is they're focused on this rate of return, and this is like this myopic focus, and they're just, that's what they're doing. But the, the bottom line is people have $90,000 left over. And let me, and I don't need to get specific answers from everybody here, but what he got me to see was this idea of people are so focused on that little small piece and trying to get a big return when we have this big chunk of money and people are just operating inefficiently. And inefficiently is we're not leveraging our money to be, you know, to get us as far as possible. There's waste. And, you know, one of the phrases I used to use a lot is if, if, if we could find money that you're losing unknowingly and or unnecessarily and reposition that money to help you accomplish your financial goals on a scale of one to 10, how interested in that would you be? Yeah. 10, 10, 10, 10, right? Yeah. That's what it comes down to. And so, so the idea here is like, if I could show you, like who here thinks you have like 5% inefficiency in your life? Like money that you're just wasting, you're not measuring, right? 10%, right? That's what it comes down to. So think about this. If I could find 10% of inefficiency here, that's $9,000, okay? That's the equivalent of a 90% rate of return with no risk. Think about that. That's crazy. And so this whole idea of financial efficiency, you know, to me, we talk a lot about the products and people like we're just programmed because we're marketed to like products solve our problems. I got news for you, products are not gonna solve your problems. Like, I love real estate investing. I run a real estate investment fund. Um, I know a lot of people here in, in, into different things. Forex trading is amazing. Like, all these different things. Crypto, like, it's not, there's no good or bad. It's just, is it right for you? Is, it, is what you're doing in alignment with your values and your beliefs, with your goals, your objectives, what you want your life to be about? It, are you using money to help you grow into becoming who you need to be to live the life that you want to live? That's really what it comes down to, right? And so... I just fell in love with this idea of financial efficiency. And now, if we want to live a wealthy life and create wealth, well, I just believe we can't, if you want to get there faster, we have to do it more efficiently. There's just, right? You want to go across the country, you know, I could have a Ferrari if it burns through gas. I could drive, I might be able to not drive as fast in a, in a Prius, but I don't have to stop as often for gas. I'll get there faster probably, right? Like, and, and, and it is what it is. So, so the question is, what is wealth? Right? Like a lot of people, a lot of people um, think about wealth as just like, all right, I'm rich, right? Like one of the things is wealth to me, I don't think there is wealth without spirituality and, and groundedness and faith, right? Whatever that means to you. I don't think there is wealth without having amazing relationships and family and friends. I don't think there is wealth without health, right? I don't think there is wealth without having time freedom. And so... To me, those are my core values. Those are things that I put first and foremost for everything. And, you know, I, I just, I think we need, to, we need to put that at the front of everything. And so I think one of the things that we came up with is to create long-term wealth, we have to first save money, right? And it's, it's the idea of, and, and, you know, Michael yesterday did this whole thing, the debtor, the saver, the wealth creator. It's an amazing concept, right? It's like it, it, that comes down to the, some of the efficiency stuff. But we got to save it, we got to grow it, and we got to protect it. Who here cares about something, you know, <laughs> right? Kids, family, right? Causes, organizations that we love, right? Think, who here wants to make an impact in the world in some capacity, right? How, what's your plan? You know, are you being intentional about utilizing your money intentionally where you know you can actualize that plan on a guaranteed basis? I don't know, you know? So to me, freedom is a big part, is one of my core values. Like, 
to me, my kids and my family are wildly important. I, what, what I leave behind, my legacy is wildly important. My cause, I live every day. But one of the things that I wasn't willing to do is like do all this, right, at the cost of this. I don't want to give up my freedom. I don't want to have to wait until I'm 70 to, to actualize all that. I want to be able to live my life now. You know what I mean? And, and to me, I think people just get stuck on the hamster wheel and they don't need to, right? And so is it fair to say that as we go through life, our needs change, right? We evolve as people, our sophistication uh, as, as investors, as savers, as business people, we grow, we change, we, we, we create, we grow as people and we, we evolve ourselves and we build our skills and, you know, we, anybody here agree we are our own best asset, right? Is everybody here, here intentional about building that asset and investing into that asset, right? And so, side note, that's not the point, but like, just hit me. If, if you are your best asset, why wouldn't you insure yourself, right? Like that's the other thing, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're your best asset and you're, you're the, like the, the best income earning mm -hmm. asset for your family and, and, and we're talking and you think generationally, think about the responsibility that comes with that. You know, that's one of the reasons, you know, foundational reason I love this. But I, I love going through this and I, and I think about, you know, financial efficiency. If we could get $1 to perform multiple functions, like you said, that's the key, right? That, that's it. Because as we, as we start our 20s, we need to save money, right? Is that fair? We should build our emergency fund and start having kind of a foundation in our life. And as we grow, we get to our 30s, we start a family, we start businesses, we do all these things. We hit 40s, we got our kids that are starting to hit college maybe. You know, I got a 13-year-old uh, that, that's going to be going to college soon. You know, we got to start thinking about these things, right? And it's like, you, got, you, you, you want to start putting money away. Like, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I hit 40, I started feeling like a little bit of mortality. Like before I hit 40, I was like, ah, I'm never going to die. Like this is like, I'm good forever. But like you hit, you hit that age and you're like, ah, oh, shit, like this life is real. Like this, you know, we got we to gotta start planning for this stuff, you know, thinking about it. And so how, what's your plan on, on, on being most efficient? You know, uh, Michael said yesterday in his presentation, the money that you have in a whole life policy when you're saving is hidden from the expected family contribution on the FAFSA. You know, so we do, I used to do a lot of college planning for families and we would meet with them two years before because it was a two year look back, right? And we'd reposition assets and move things around as a way to make sure that, that we would redu reduce their um, actual cost for college because we all get marketed the sticker price for college, but we don't realize that the actual price that you have to pay after all of the, the, the ways, if you pick the right college. So I, my, my whole tagline used to be, don't just save for college, save on college. And everybody's marketed to go save in a 529 account. Or anybody know what a 529 account is, right? It's a, it's a college savings plan for your kids. You get the tax deduction on the front end and it's used tax-free if you, if you use it for college. But, but the problem is that's 100% counted to, towards your EFC. So if you save enough, you may get that return, you may whatever, but it's gonna cost you 50% more for college by putting your money there. People don't think about that. So that's side note. But, um, you know, then you get to your 50s and you want to build wealth and you get to your 60s. And now it's like the thing that, that, that drives me nuts about saving for retirement is this idea of retirement. My buddy Garrett Gunderson always says he's on a mission to retire the word retirement, you know, because, because it's, you know, right? And, and because, because it's like, it's, it's just such old thinking. It's like, and think about it. We're all trained to save money and invest until we're 65, right? And then maybe when we're 65, you know, anybody know somebody that's like worked their whole life and gotten to 65 and then retired and then like died six months later? Right. It's so sad. Yeah. Because a lot of them never got to their retirement. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Like, and, and so to me, I think it's a crime that the financial industry is designed to get you to only think about planning until you're 65. I mean, if, if, if you start work, let's face it, most of us probably started being really successful. We're not all like jewels. We don't like start million dollar businesses when we're 20. <laughs> but like, you know, like most of us probably didn't start like hitting our stride until we're 30 or 35. Is that fair? Like, I mean, you know, whatever. And, and if that's the case, you know, we got maybe 30 to 35 years of income earning potential. Does that make sense? Right? So when we hit 35, did you know if you're married, you got a 40% chance that one of you is going to live till 95 now? 
So that means when you hit retirement, we're taught to save till 65, our money has to last as long without making money as it took for us to save it and earn it. And then you got to deal with all the ups and downs in the economy because there's going to be probably, you know, three or four boom bust cycles during that time, right? And, and think about the anxiety that you will have if you have no income coming in and you got to make that money last. It's nuts. It's complete insanity. So why isn't it like at the age of 40 or 30 or 50, why don't we start being like, all right, what's my plan until I die? You know, why am I not planning from now until I leave this place? You know, and that's why I just believe, you know, Stephen Covey, you know, principles of success are not negotiable. The seven habits of highly effective people begin with the end of mind and reverse engineer a plan to get there. What, does anybody here plan on 65 being the end? I don't think so. Yeah, so, Ken, Dr. Kev, what do you say, buddy? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, so, so one of the, one of the things, one of the things that really hit me, one of the things that really hit me is, is this concept of cash flow investing. I think the idea of investing for accumulation, which is a traditional Wall Street model, they want, because they want to control your money, let's face it, right? The Wall Street cartel, right? They want to control your money. And, and, and in doing that, I realized like, that's a broken model. Think about it. One of, the, one of the things I say all the time is we have to, and you'll hear me say it all the time, we have to align our money with our values and beliefs. And each one of us have our own unique fingerprint, so to speak, our own blueprint that we have to utilize in our life. And there are certain attributes and principles that are, you know, non-negotiable, but that's a big thing. But I do believe also that this idea of the power of the subconscious mind is real. Anybody believe in that? Right? what we th think deep down. There's, there's a great book. Anybody here read the book, The Ant and the Elephant? I think I reference this book more than any other book in the world. And it's a simple little short book. It's like 80 something pages. Have you read it, Joe? No? So The Ant and the Elephant. I, Vincent Pacenti was an Olympic downhill skier. I would suggest everybody go read it. It's an amazing fable. Um, but the idea is in the book, it, it talks about the power of the subconscious mind. And so they've done studies on this and they showed um, that when they scan your brain, and you make a conscious decision, four million neurons a second are firing off in your brain. But subconsciously, when, you're, when your subconscious mind is going, it's four billion neurons a second. So thinking, and, and anybody know, uh, anybody that's uh, ever had a uh, New Year's resolution and hasn't completed it, right? It's because we're consciously making these decisions and we're white knuckling it and gripping it, but eventually it's only four million neurons fighting 4 billion neurons, it's the equivalent of an ant sitting on the head of an elephant thinking it has the ability to steer the elephant. That's the idea, right? And so, so when you look at that, when you look at that, it's, it's, it's insanity. Like we're, we're going through this. And, and when I, what, what, what hit me, no, I took my knowledge from the financial space and financial efficiency and seeing what everybody's doing. And I go, well, crap, of course nobody is, is, is going to be successful because you don't subconsciously believe that you even have a shot in the dark of being successful. Because if we think about financial principles, I, I want to talk about a couple key points here. Anybody uh, know what the rule of 72 is? I, we talked about it a little bit yesterday, right? So the rule of 72, just to, you take 72, you divide it by the return, right? And, and that gets you how long is it going to take your money to double? Um, and, and anybody know what the 4% rule is? No. Okay. So the 4% rule is an idea. It's, it, we use what's called Monte Carlo simulations. They run simulations to figure out, all right, when you follow the traditional models and you get to 65, what are the, what's the likelihood, what rate of distribution do you need to take? So this 4% rule comes from, that's the safe, that's the safe rate of distribution. If you have like a 401k and you go to, you know, take income in retirement, that's what percent of your pile of money you can distribute without running a significant risk of running out of money during your life, right? Who wants to run out of money when they're alive? Nobody, obviously, right? And so what's not talked about is inflation, right? Anybody ever here think about how inflation is going to impact your needs for retirement? Anybody felt inflation recently, right? <laughs> Nuts, right? Did you guys know that since 1970, so anybody know what the federal funds, uh, the Federal Reserve, what their target rate of inflation is, what their goal is? 2%, 2 right? Does anybody know what the average rate is? I, I should hide this, but it's there. It's 
Since 1971, the federal funds um, average inflation rate is actually 4.2%. Okay? It's, that shows how good the Federal Reserve is at doing their job. You know, over the 50 whatever years, it's like they, it, they're twice as bad at doing, hitting their targets. And the reason is because when inflation comes out, like a year like, you know, 2021, mm -hmm. it's like toothpaste. You can't get it back in the bottle. Yeah. Right? When, you ha when it happens, you can't get it back in. And so, like at the end of the day, inflation is a real problem. So let's go back to the power of the subconscious mind, right? So if you're, 100, if you're earning $100,000 and you're 30 years old, right, we talk about how long is it going to take our money to double, but how long is it going to be before you need to double your income just to maintain your standard of living? How does that impact your need to actually save money to be able to meet this 4% rule? So what this looks like is if, if right now you're making $100,000, and you, you go, all right, $100,000 I need to save up. If I'm doing the 4% rule, I need $2.5 million, right? Because 4% of $2.5 million is one hundred grand. So you could take your $100,000 based on $2.5 million of income, and you could live a relatively safe retirement. But the problem is we're not thinking about inflation. So if you're 30 years old right now, you go, all right, I don't really understand all this stuff. And by the way, you can't plan for anything you don't understand. And if you don't understand it, your subconscious mind is always going to be self-sabotaging you. And you're just going to be like, oh, screw this. I can't do this. So I'm just going to enjoy life right now. Let's go party. <laughs> you guys want to get a yacht or something? It'll be fun. But like, you know, I mean, that's, that's what happens. And so, so the thing is, though, like we go here and it's $100,000 a year right now. But did you know that with a 4% rule, we talk about money doubling. Well, we need to double our income. By the time you're 48, you're going to need $200,000 a year just to maintain your standard of living. Anybody? I mean, if we go back in time to, to the 80s, everybody knows things are cheaper in the 80s. And this is inflation. It's just built into, the, built into the equation. It's the greatest hidden tax in the world. And so by the time you're 66, that 100000 turns into 400000 just to maintain, meaning $400,000 for a 30 year old right now at 66 years old is gonna buy them the equivalent amount of goods as $100,000 buys today. Does that make sense to everybody? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. So when we, when we look at that, do you know how much money you need to save to be able to have a 4% distribution to be safe? It's $10 million. $10 million. Anybody here know anybody making $100,000 right now at a W-2 job that thinks they can save and get to $10 million at retirement? <laughs> no. no, right? It's just, it's insanity. So this is the power of the subconscious mind. So, if you, the human brain will only allow you to put 100% of effort into something you believe with 100% certainty you have a chance of being successful with. Do I need to say that again? Yes. Yeah. The human brain will only allow you to put 100% of effort into something you believe you have a chance of being successful with. So if you don't believe you got a shot, which we, you guys all just acknowledge, there's no shot. If you don't believe that, you're not going to execute. You're not going to do it. This is why I became really just passionate and obsessed with the idea of cash flow investing. Not because, I don't know, a lot of reasons, they just, but because I believe, let's face it, $100,000, right? We take a, somebody earning $100,000 right now. The power of cash flow investing is that we can chunk away, like, my, let's just call it just for the sake of round numbers, we want to get to $10,000 a month, right? That's 120, but like, we'll just call it $10,000 a month. If we delay gratification and we save our money, and then we grow our money and we protect it, like I showed earlier, well, we got to save it. We got to have that delayed gratification. We got to build our financial foundation. And then when we invest, we want to invest for cash flow assets, right? We want to invest in real estate and other, ca you know, it could be dividend producing stocks. It could be like a lot of different things, but like, I love real estate just because of the tax benefits and all the things that go along with it, right? But when we, when we look at that, the reason I love cash flow investing has more to do with our subconscious mind than anything else because it's important not just that you have the technicals, but that you actually believe in what you're doing. Right? Because why? Because if I, if I tell you, hey, Monty, you need to get to $10 million to be safe. <laughs> like that's, and even if like we could get there, like you save for a couple of years, you're like, oh, I got 60 grand. Well, only $9,940,000 to go. <laughs> yeah, right? Holy crap. But if I say, you know what, we got to get you to $10,000 a month in passive income. Even if it takes a couple of years and you don't have any passive income yet, if you've built the foundation, you started saving, then you start investing in cash flow producing assets. And year four, you get your first cash flow producing asset that's doing like 300 bucks a month, right? may not seem like a lot, but 
you and your subconscious believes that you can get to $10,000 a month in income. Why? Because you've seen it hit your bank account. You've done it before. You don't have to reprogram your subconscious to actually try to be successful. You just have to execute. It's kind of like evidence, right? Your subconscious. 100%. You start to develop evidence. You're like, oh, it's true. Exactly. Exactly. And so this is why I love it. Like, I, there are no good or bad products. I love whole life insurance as a foundational asset because I, it's a self-completing plan, right? Like, as we go through life, um, you know, we could save our money in a high-yield savings account. We could you know, do all these different things. But when we talk about, you know, getting each dollar to perform multiple functions, is it fair to say like when you're young, you need to save money. Then we, so it's an emergency fund. And then we want to have an opportunity fund so we can find investment deals. Maybe we can do private lending. Maybe we invest in our own real estate. Maybe we build our own business. Maybe it could be a plethora of things. But the idea is you're, you're finding cash flowing opportunities. And then from there, you know, we go through life and we got our kids. We want to make sure we have life insurance because, hey, you know, if something happens, I want to make sure that what I want to happen happens when I want it to happen, whether I'm here to see it or not, right? Like that's, to me, that's what I want my life to be about. I, the worst thing that would happen is me passing away and something tragic and then my wife is stuck with our three kids and no money and, and, and no completion of that plan, right? I, one of the things I love about it is like you get to buy your result. Think about, think about the power of this. I call it gamifying life. Right, like you have the ability to lock in your desired result. Does everybody here like know what you want your life to be about? Like if you think about it, I had this crazy ayahuasca experience where I actually like experienced dying and being on my deathbed and, and having conversations with my wife and my kids and my family and my business partners and, and like all the unfulfilled shit that I had going on, right? And, and uh, you can't unfeel those things, right? Like that's the power of that kind of stuff, right? And, and so, when I had that experience, like that made this really real to me. And, and, and you, you say like, wow, we have the ability to say, wow, what do I want my life to be about at the end of the day? And I can lock in that result, right? I can, I can guarantee in a, that, that that is accomplished. And think about how freeing it is when you say, okay, I know what I want to leave behind. I know what I want my legacy to be. I know what I want to leave my family and I know what I want to leave the causes and I know what I want you know, that overall legacy to be about, I can guarantee that result and then that just makes life fun, right? I get to show up and be the best version of myself I can be. It lowers my stress. It does all these different things. And so, you know, I think it's sad that we live in the most prosperous country in the history of the world and 95% of people are reaching retirement and not able to maintain their standard of living. Think about that. How disgusting is that? Like if it were, if it were 50% of people, I could be like, ah, it's human behavior. It's this, it's that 95% is a systematic problem. Does everybody agree to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that's a big deal to me. Um, one of the things I want to do here, um, and I got to bounce around here. These are QR codes. I got some free gifts for you guys, some books, audio books, and all sorts of fun stuff. But this is, this is just like to, to get into the cash flow hacking thing. <laughs> This is my brain. So, um, no, don't, don't worry about all of it. Don't worry about all of it. But like, all right, all right, all right. Okay. So, what? No, this is like, no, but like, I mean, guys, so, so everybody who doesn't know, I would really encourage everybody to watch my YouTube channel. I have uh, what I think is an amazing YouTube channel, but, um, I'm a nerd about this. I love this shit. You know, like I love this stuff. And, and I'm oddly passionate. She's always like, so Hannah always used to say to me, she's like, Chris, like there's nothing sexy about life insurance. Like, like that, you know, whatever. I'm like helping people is sexy, babe. Like this is, this is awesome. But like, yeah, I, I, I nerd out about this stuff. I'm oddly like passionate about what I do, I guess, like in life insurance and this stuff. But, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, so I wanted to give an example um, because I wanted to show like the power of this in cash flow. And one of, my, one of my passions is showing people, I call this a retirement rescue plan, right? Because most people get to 50 and they're like so far behind, they don't have a chance, right? And then that's where desperation sets in and that's where health starts to fall apart because people get stressed and like all these things. And so I would encourage everybody to start younger than 50, obviously, but we are where we are. And if you are 50 and you feel behind, like, you know, we can help. But like, the bottom line is, if you, if, you, 
if you start focusing on cash flow investing, you got to be willing to follow the process. But within 10 to 15 years, you could be financially free from where you are right now, no problem, right? And, and this is just an example to show. I just did an illustration on what it would be like to utilize um, a policy for cash flow investing for real estate, okay? And so what we have here, uh, actually, let me get this and this. All right, so bang, bang. Okay, so everybody see this? Uh, I can't zoom in more on this, unfortunately. It's zoomed in as much as I can do. If, you can, if you're back there, you can look at that one, okay? So you can see here, what we did here um, is we took an investor uh, that had 50, 50 60,000 bucks sitting in a um, like savings account or some other kind of liquid capital, and we front loaded a policy with $60,000, okay? Out of that $60,000, what we had is $55,000 of net cash value available year one. Now, a lot of people go, well, I could just put my money in a savings account, in a high yield savings account, make 4%, 5%, whatever, but you don't get other benefits. Any, anybody here love controlling their money, love controlling the results in their life? Who here loves the medical system? You do? Okay. Okay, all right. I'm like, damn, I did not expect you to love the medical so, so, So here's the deal. Um, I want to share a little quick story before I go to this, before I forget, is um, on November 4th, 2024, my father-in-law was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Um, they gave him 90 days to live. And uh, he we went in with a pickleball injury, twisted his ankle, and, and ultimately, you know, he was, he was given that 90 days to live, and, and we, he was diagnosed. They found a seven and a half centimeter tumor on his pancreas that had spread to his liver. 2020. Four, four years ago. Oh, yeah, sorry. 2020, it was, we just hit the four-year anniversary. Um, we were able to accelerate um, the death benefit, like this number right here. One of the benefits, anybody here uh, really fully plan for long-term care? Do you, do you know that you have a 70% chance of needing assisted living or something before you die? Right? It's, it, it, medical risk in retirement is one of the greatest risks to your wealth and to your legacy and everything, right? And so that's something to think about. Anybody here uh, want to like, have complete control over your medical directive and be able to manage your medical treatment care uh, on your terms and not according to the, to the health insurance company, oh, yeah. right? So, so this is one of those things. We, we, you can accelerate a portion of this death benefit while you're alive to put it towards whatever medical treatment you want. In this case, we were able to do all sorts of alternative treatments. If you want to talk to us on the side, you can. Um, but he's alive today, playing golf four days a week, able to hang out with his grandkids. He just traveled to the Dominican. The kids are at his house right now. You know, as we're here with you guys, such a blessing, right? That wouldn't be the case if he didn't have the ability to not just have to lean on the only options the insurance company gave him. Can you explain a little bit more about accelerated benefit? Yeah, so... Um, Life insurance has riders on it. Like there, it's called an accelerated benefit rider. So they take your death benefit. Um, and so that's why, like, if you use it for while you're alive, you're not going to have the death benefit. So that's why it's important to have, like, kind of a whole portfolio to make sure that you have it covered. But what they'll do is if you become critically, chronically, or terminally diagnosed, so critically is, like, two of six uh, daily living activities or, like, a heart attack or, you know, chronic illness can be, like, diabetes type 2 or something like that. And... Terminal illness is usually a 12 to 24 month diagnosis of terminal illness, which is typically a cancer diagnosis or something like that, right? Um, strokes would be critical, like stuff like, they allow you to accelerate and take money um, from your death benefit to support you and you can use it whatever you want. You have to buy that rider when you're- It's automatic, depending on the company, depending on the company you use, it's, okay. it's usually included as part of it, but that's why company selection is important, right? right? Mm -hmm. so, so really important stuff. Um, but here, how much time do I have? Um, 13 more minutes. Okay. Oh, good. I got time. Here we go. So, um, so, so here's the deal. Um, let's get back to this. Whoa, hey now. Oh, come on now. Bang. All right. So we got the 60,000, 55,000 liquid. Now what we have going on is you could see $10,000 a year is the premium. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Everybody with me? Okay. So what I did here, you can see that the increase in net cash value, which is how much the value of the policy is going up. Um, I didn't do the whole thing. We can, I can meet with anybody and do this for you and show you what it would look like for you individually because that's the important part. 
um, but you could see the negative 41,000. Anytime you see a negative number here, means I was able to take loans against the policy to buy a real estate property. And what I did is my assumptions on this model was a $250,000 property, which I know doesn't exist in California, but there are other places in the world you can do this, you know, Minnesota, go to Minnesota with our buddy, Brandon, you know, like, so, so, so the idea was we got to put, we got to put 20% down, 25, 25% down on, on, a, on a rental property. So we're taking $50,000, or I think it's 20% down is my assumption on this. Um, take $50,000, put it down on a down payment. And so you're basically getting kind of like two mortgages, right? Like you have your policy loan mortgage and you, and you do that. And then you have your regular mortgage, your investor mortgage. And then you take the cash flow from the property and use a portion of that cash flow to recapitalize. You pay back. This is the banking function, right? You're, you're kind of utilizing that to start because obviously... If you could, you'd do the whole thing, the whole property through here, but you can't start there, right? Because like, otherwise you've got to save for too long and most people lose their steam and whatever. We want to start getting results. But you can see I got one house, two house, three house, four house, five house. Now, but of course I'm starting with 60,000. If I didn't have that 60, maybe I had 20 or 10 a year, like whatever, it might take a little longer to get the first house, but just start, right? The best time to plant a tree is when? When now. 30, year, 30 years ago, guys, come on. Next best time, now, right? So like we can only do what we can. We want to do the best we can from here moving forward. That's all we want to do, right? So, so Chris, are yeah. any, firstly, are there any limitations to the amount that you can front load no. policy? No, you, none. No, I have, as much as you want. I have a, I just did a policy, a guy front loaded 2.8 million and he's doing $340,000 a year. And then that, sorry, that's, okay, so that's 60,000 that you invested. That is growing. The insurance company is taking that, and it's and it's generating a rate of return. Yeah. On it as well. Hundred percent. Right? Yeah. Right? So and the then borrow, and then you're borrowing against that sixty. You're borrowing at that sixty thousand at a particular. Right. So the the cool part is you're never taking the money out of the policy. You're borrowing against the policy. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, in this situation, we take that. You know, we're borrowing fifty thousand dollars against it. That fifty thousand is still growing and earning the dividend. On the side, we have. An, interest rate that we're paying back to the insurance company, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And that's, that's how it works. So basically, that will set like, well, depending on the rate, the, the growth rate minus the... Correct. Is, is your actual cost of... Exactly. Of borrowing. Exactly. Okay. And then just as you say that, your actual uh, increase uh, uh, during this time that you borrow the money is the arbitrage between the uh, mortgage and payment. So, so I'm really cautious about the conversation around arbitrage because okay. that would indicate there's a spread between like, I'm... I've, I'm, I'm paying uh, less in interest than I'm earning in the policy. That's not really how it works. Okay. But I can show you that because of the fact that we're paying simple interest, right? Kind of like a line of credit on a house. And if yeah. anybody familiar with velocity banking at all, right? Like, so if you're paying simple interest and we're earning compound, I could show you how I could earn three and a half here and pay five and a half and I'm still coming out ahead. But this is just, that's why math and money math are completely different. Yeah. And people, people, get, people get sold on math for your personal finances, but money math is, is completely different, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so, and Morgan, do you have a? Just quickly. Yeah. Is there a tax advantage to putting that 50 in? Oh, huge. Like, well, so you don't get to write it off, but it grows tax free. Right. You so have there, access. No, there is no, no tax. Immediate tax advantage. No, no immediate tax advantage. Okay. You're doing it with post tax dollars, okay. right? Yep. 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 No, that's good. Okay. Thank you for the clarity. Um, but you could see here, here's the deal. <laughs> if we're going to, like, anybody here want to invest in real estate? or invest in a business yeah. or do something of that nature, right? So if we want to do that anyway, well, let's go back to the beginning. Let's do it as efficiently as possible. Is that fair? Yeah. Right? And so what this comes down to is like, what would my options be? To me, the, the greatest thing in personal finance that people don't talk to is my three favorite words, compared to what, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> what is the investment doing based on its risk profile compared to the, our, our alternatives, right? And so we can't compare this what you're looking at to an investment because it doesn't have the same risk profile. You can't lose money in this, okay? That's the difference. Any investment out there comes with risk, okay? So compared to what? Well, you could compare it to a savings account. This is a savings account on steroids. You're gonna, you're gonna beat savings account returns long-term. You're gonna get additional benefits, a death benefit, living benefits, protection of your, over your health directive, all that stuff, right? That's pretty awesome. We've done long-term studies 
And every, over the, my buddy Tom Wall wrote a book, uh, Permission to Spend, amazing, amazing book. He's got his PhD in retirement income planning. Um, he did a, a, a study that showed, as part of his dissertation, that showed every 90, uh, over the last 90 years, every 30 year rolling time frame, whole life actually beat bonds as far as returns, okay? So this is a bond alternative, right? And everybody knows when we get to retirement, we're gonna need to save money, right? So we can leverage it our whole life and then when we get to retirement, it solves a different problem for us. That's why I love it, it grow, there's no other asset that will grow with you as you grow through life and your needs change, right? You're in your 20s, you need to save, you're in your 30s, you gotta start investing, you have an opportunity fund to start investing. 40s, start having kids going to college, you got this money you can pull from and leverage and reduce your costs there, operate more efficiently, you get to retirement, you got your volatility buffer, you're protected, you can access the death benefit to help with your medical stuff when you become more at risk for that. And then obviously you have life insurance is the, is the, the best way to tax efficiently transfer your legacy. Mm -hmm. There's no other asset that will grow with you the way that this will. Where, where does that 60K get invested? Where, where, where does the funds you get it in? So, so life insurance companies will, your, your 60K goes into the general fund of the life insurance company and they then uh, invest in, in uh, they, well, they invest in bonds, treasuries, uh, AAA rated, you know, corporate what's average, bonds. What's the average value of return? So right now the dividend on this, uh, this example is 5.2, but they just increased it. This company just increased it to 5.7. Um, long-term history, Mass Mutual just did a, a study that showed the after fees internal rate of return. And remind you, this is tax-free. The real internal rate of return after all fees over the past 30 years, actually this was in 2018, so from 2018, 30 years before that, was 6.13%. Tax-free. Tax-free. That doesn't suck, right? <laughs> right? I mean, it's not, it's not going to like get you excited, but what gets you excited is the fact that you have that and it's safe and you compare it to what your options are for your safe money of your portfolio, and then you can leverage it to go take your risk and invest in things that you understand. Invest in, you know, borrow against it to come to events like this. You know, that's, that's the key. Like that is, anybody have any questions about that? Are we good? All right, so here's, let me land the plane on this just to show you, and, and once again, I'm happy. You could probably tell, I, I could talk about this Your all day long. Yeah. What? I know, I know, they, they keep saying that. I'm gonna get a hook and they're gonna pull me off stage. The, um, I'm like, you gave me the stage, I'm not giving it up. The, um, <laughs> So, 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 I know. So, so check this out. So when we look at this, I looked at those, like, look at this policy. Okay, I want to, I want to show this. So in this example, okay, we got $150,000 of total premium we've paid over the first 10 years. Is that fair? Okay. So now what we've done with that $150,000, we've been able to acquire five houses. All because we, I don't know yet because I don't have that off, off the top. But check the, but ch I, I got that after. I'll show you what it looks like. That. So so check this out though. 150 thousand of my own money because then what? I'm buying properties and then what's happening? I'm using tenants' money and the cash flow, their money to put back in, and I'm just leveraging and I'm compounding and I'm doing that. You know what I'm saying? And what what this shows, mind you, in this example because I wanted to be like. Under promise, over deliver, right? Like that kind of deal. In this example, I'm showing only doing five and at year 10, I'm stopping at 41 years old. I'm not buying another property. I just want to see what will these houses do? What will it look like? And I go out till 65 and you can see the real estate that I buy with based on a 5% average increase in the real estate value, which long-term is kind of what it averages out to be depending on your market and depending on what you're doing. But the first property will be worth that we bought for 250,000 will, will be worth 1.4 million. The next one, 1.16 and you can see We've got a total of $5.3 million of real estate value at age 65, at age 65, okay? That 5.3 million, we're also gonna have, and I, and I went down here, I'll show you, that, that also has 799,000 of cash value now in the policy. So, Tax-free, tax-free. Now you can utilize this for your health directive as a volatility buffer, as a bond alternative, all that stuff. And we have $321,000 assuming an 8% cash flow out of those properties of cash flow that you're able to live off. All just using $150,000 of your own money for 10 years. Like how everybody 
doesn't do this is mind-numbing to me. Correct, correct, correct. You're not living off that cash flow. 100%. The cash flow from the real estate is being recap is recapitalizing your bank and going into buying new properties. That's great, assuming that you have a real estate background, you understand you can find five properties. Well, we, we also have a turnkey. We also do like turn, we have a relationship with a guy that runs a, an amazing turnkey program that is awesome. Right, so, because a lot of but, people use that cash value for emergencies, for unexpected expenses. For sure, so for sure. Case, yeah, so. You're not, you're not building wealth, you're just leveraging the cash. 100%. Remember, we go through the different stages. At first, this is an emergency fund. Once you get to the place where you're ready, it becomes an opportunity fund, you invest it, right? That's where the banking concept comes in. Before that, you're just, you're building your financial foundation. So, I don't know. Any questions? I know, so I'm running out of time. <laughs> And I'm happy to meet with anybody offline. Before I, before I go, oh crap, sorry, I wanna, ah, hold on. You can ask questions. So that spreadsheet is gonna be your very healthy forever. Yeah. So he, does he lock in that status? He locks in his health status forever. Okay. Yeah, starting younger always makes sense, but I can show you because of all the tax rules and the mech rules and like all the government stuff that I'm not gonna like nerd out on and confuse you with right now. Um, when you're older, there are different thresholds that you can fund more with less death benefit and it kind of makes up for it. And so we can, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I know your health rating is locked in forever. So guys, I wanna, I wanna do a couple things. Um, I, I just wanna give this away real quick and I know I gotta get off the stage before he attacks me. So, um, <laughs> So we got, I got a couple things here. I got a living legacy course on the left if you want to scan that code. It didn't work. That's, okay, I tell you what, come see me after if it didn't work. On all of them, it was a 404? You know what, I'll, I'll put it in the WhatsApp group too. I'll put it in the WhatsApp group. Does that work? Does that work? Um, I'll put it, they're all 404 airing? All right, well, I guess. Wah, wah, wah. Um, so, okay, so, so long story short, I have a living, this is just stuff I want to give you guys. I don't know if everybody, I have my book, Cash Flow Hacking, which teaches you all the stuff that I'm talking about. It'll walk you through that. That's the one on the far right. The one in the middle is a, a book called What Would the Rockefellers Do? But it's the audio version of the book. Great. Anybody that wants to listen to it. I also have physical copies. If you want to get one, come see me. Uh, I'm happy to mail one to you um, and have my team mail one to you. I won't do anything. My team will do it. Um, and then the other one, is the one on the far left is a living legacy course. So the What Would the Rockefellers book, um, that is my buddy Garrett Gunderson. He wrote that book and he's amazing. Uh, I partnered with him. I wrote the foreword for it um, and it's amazing. And then on the left uh, one is the living legacy course. If that's not working, I'll get you guys that one. Um, but that is literally an online course, uh, you know, that we used to sell for $497 and we're giving it to you for free. So. All right, perfect. Everybody good? Garrett, he's my buddy, yeah. Oh, you do? All right, cool. So, rock and roll. That's it. All right. Oh, I get a whoosh. And a whoosh. Thanks, guys. All right. You're the best neurologist. <laughs> <laughs>